Welcome, glad you're here. This is a big event here. This clip here that you're about to watch is something that is so important because yesterday what we did is we went through the book of Revelation chapter 17. We also uh, uh, talked about uh, Revelation chapter 18, touched on it, Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 13, and Reve Revelation chapter 14. So we touched on a lot of those other chapters, but it was chapter 17 that we really focused in on. Now, let me go ahead and pull up the chart. All right. Now, this chart here, it should help you to uh, remember that Revelation chapter 17 is about the succession of eight kings leading up to the return of Christ, and uh, that John saw an image. The image was a beast that had seven heads and ten horns. The heads represent two things. One is that they represent seven mountains on which the woman sits. The seven heads also represent seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh he must continue a short space. And the eighth king is the beast. He's one that goes into uh, the bottomless pit and gets the power seat and authority of Satan. It goes to fighting against Christ when Christ comes back. But we were left with a lot of questions as to, okay, where are the kings from? Yeah, which country are they from? Yeah, are any of the kings ruling today? Are we on the first king, the second king? Which one of the eight is ruling today if there is one? But you know what? You've been reading the prophetic playbook story. And hasn't the prophetic playbook story been a big help for you. Now this is so important because it's helping us to validate what you've been reading in the prophetic playbook story. Now we're diving into the chapters and we're looking at like the whole chapter of Revelation chapter 17. And you can see that nothing's being taken out of context. You can see for yourself the angel tells John about the succession of the eight kings. We know that the eighth king goes to fight against Christ when Christ comes back in power and glory. We know that the eighth king gets the power, seat, and authority of Satan. So this was validated yesterday. We're going to go through it a little bit today, too. But I got another clip. I got another clip to show you that uh, we're going to be going through Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11 is the foundational chapter out of all the Bible. For, under, <coughs> excuse me, for understanding how the prophetic events play out from 1925 to the return of Christ in power and glory. That chapter, Daniel chapter 11, has so much information in it, all in consecutive order without any major time gaps. It is the foundational chapter. So we're going to be talking about Daniel chapter 11 today. And it's going to help us to find out where the eight kings, which countries are they from? And uh, so we're to be talking about that. Now, um, in the prophetic playbook, uh, we talked about there's a, there's a list of the 50 huge, major, astonishing, and or significant Bible signs discovered or pointed out. Yet yesterday... Uh, or in the video prior, you saw a list of, there was like 20 different things that we touched on in that clip yesterday. And only three are part of the list here. So guys, we cover a lot of information. So yesterday, um, list number one, four, and 29 was touched on. And what I want you to do is that uh, if you haven't been doing it, I hope you have. But when you go through this, uh, when you go through the book, I want you to write down uh, by the list. I want you to write down along the list there. Uh, yes, no, probably not, probably so, or I don't know. That is, uh, this is not where 
I'm saying, gosh, you got to believe me. You got to believe me. You got to market a yes. No. As you review the information, as you mark off uh, each item on the list there, uh, how do you feel about it? Do you agree or, or do you not agree? You know, is it yes, I agree or no or probably not or probably so or I don't know. But here's the other thing is that as you go through and read the book, I want you to write down your questions and impressions and, uh, and suggestions and confirmations. So as you go through the book, write on it. You know, put down the questions, put down the impressions, put down the suggestions, put down the confirmations. And then when you're done reading the book, go back through and look to see if questions have been answered and uh, and just kind of review what you've written down. But the other thing is, is I want you to go through the list of the 53 items that are mentioned on there. And, uh, and yeah, I suggest that you write down um, the yes, no, probably not, probably so, uh, or I don't know. Write it, use a pencil so that you can go back through and you can change them as you want to. And so hopefully by the end of the book, uh, you'll be able to go back through that list and update it and see that, you know what? Uh, now having reviewed more of the information, perhaps that will help you to gravitate more towards the yes or no area there. Now, what we're going to be covering today uh, on the prophetic playbook in the prophetic playbook story you're going to be um, you'll be able to mark off 1 through 14 1 through 14 so yesterday we touched on three of them and now we're going to go through 1 through 14 today so now this is a very big uh, day here. Very important information. If we can identify where we are in the prophetic event, which one of the eight kings is in power today, that's huge. Now you've been reading the book. I'm not giving you anything, any new surprises here. You've read the book here. But what we are going to do is we're going to go through Daniel chapter 11 and really look at, uh, at the chapter more closely. And we're going to be focusing in on like verses 1 through 8 today in particular. But we're going to kind of uh, go to the end of it as well and just take a look at um, and verify that Daniel chapter 11 ends leading up to with the return of Christ and power and glory. Chapter 12 um, really helps to identify that fact. So we're going to show the clip now. And, uh, and then after the clip, we'll talk a little bit more. That's Revelation chapter 17. We found that John had seen a succession of eight kings leading up to the second coming of Christ. And what we're going to be looking at in Daniel chapter 11 is to see that it shows also a succession of many kings. And within that set of many kings... There is a succession of eight kings. And that succession of eight kings is the same succession of eight kings that John the Revelator talked about in Revelation chapter 17. This is so exciting and so important because if we can identify which of the eight kings is alive and ruling today, that is awesome. To be able to say, hey, look, here we are in the prophetic events right here. And we're going to be able to do that. However, to get set up for that, what we want to do is uh, we want to take a, a quick look at the end of Daniel chapter 11 and also into the first couple of verses of Daniel chapter 12. Now, before we do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through uh, the group of verses that talk about the succession of the eight kings so you can get a quick view of that so in verses 21 through 45 it talks about the eighth king in verses 
uh, 20 to 22, it talks about the seventh king. In verses 10 through 19, it talks about the sixth king. And in verses 5 through 9, it talks about the fifth king. And then in verses 2 through 4, it talks about the fourth king. And in verse 2, it talks about the first four kings. Now what I'd like to do is like to verify that Daniel chapter 11 ends with the second coming of Christ, when Christ returns in power and glory. Let's go ahead and look at verse 21 to learn what Daniel called the person which we are identifying as the eighth king. And then we will look at verses 36 through 38, and that shows some of his evil powers. And then we'll go into verses 43 to 45 to see what this king is doing leading up to the end of his time on earth. Okay, on to verse 21 to learn about the name Daniel called this eighth king. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Isn't that interesting? This, this king, this eighth king, he's called the vile person. And somehow he's going to be able to take over uh, a kingdom, even though they're not giving him the honor of being the king there. And yet he's still going to be the king. We'll get into more of that later as we get into overview part five, I believe that is. Okay, let's go on. Now, does this vile person show any signs of having received the power, seat, and authority of Satan? Look at the next verses. In verse 36, we read, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate he shall honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not. So shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Oh yeah, he definitely shows signs of him having the power, seat, and authority of Satan, doesn't he? Now let's read about what this king is up to leading to the end of his time on earth. All right, now, this same king, this vile person king, is being referred to in the verse 43 of Daniel chapter 11. And that's where we're going to start right now. But he, the vile person, shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas of the glorious and holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Now what are the, the seas that he's talking about? The, the glorious holy mountain. What is he referring to? Well, the glorious holy mountain is the Mount of Olives, and the seas would be the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. So what we learn is this vile person, he comes to the end of his mortality when he is over by the Mount of Olives, and what's happening during this time? We learn about what's happening during this time in the next two verses in Daniel chapter 12. It says, and at this time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting contempt. 
So we see that that is during the time that Christ comes back in power and glory. And so Daniel chapter 11 ends with the return of Christ in power and glory. So now what we want to do is we want to be able to make some connections with Revelation chapter 17 that we covered in God in Our Future Overview Part 1. The vile person in Daniel chapter 11, verse 21, is the eighth king. The beast, as we learned about in Revelation chapter 17, in Daniel chapter 11, this eighth king is referred to in verses 21 through 45. In overview part one, it was shown that the eighth king received the power, seat, and authority of Satan and went to fight against Christ when Christ came back. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 11, we read, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. The eighth what? In verse 10, they were just talking about kings. So he's the eighth king and is of the seven kings and goeth into perdition. Now we learn about the power that the eighth king has in Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. It says, and the beast that I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. And we learn in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, that the dragon is Satan. In verse 9 it says, And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Okay, so we learn in Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, that when Christ returns in power and glory, that the eighth king, called the beast, is cast into a lake burning with brimstone. It says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, which wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Nice connection is made there. Another connection to quickly make is about the seventh king. The seventh king in Revelation chapter 17 verse 10 only continues as a king for a short space. Verse 10 reads, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. That's the seventh king. Now, here in Daniel chapter 11, the seventh king is referred to in verses 20 through 22. And look at verse 20. Then shall stand up in his estate, that is the person who I refer to as the sixth king, a riser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within few days, he, this seventh king, shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. So a person known to the people as the riser of taxes person is the next king. However, he doesn't last as king, but for just a few days before he is destroyed. The sixth king is referred to in verses 10 through 19. Next king in Revelation chapter 17 is referred to as is. In verse 10 we read, And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. God wanted us to know about this king who is. Call him the sixth king. And we have good information about him. The first five kings are covered in verses 2 through 8. And that is the topic of this overview, and it is exciting. Since John and Daniel both saw kings leading up to the return of Christ in power and glory, if we are anywhere close to the return of Christ in power and glory, then one of those kings is ruling today. And which one is he? Where is he? What's his name? What are the prophetic events that he will do? Let's begin with Daniel chapter 11, verse 1. Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will shew thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. 
and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his prosperity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others besides those. And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, he shall be strong above him, and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. But out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail and shall also carry captive into Egypt their gods and their prince and their precious vessels of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. The information reads like a story, doesn't it? And yet, it is prophetic. It is true. The focus of these nine verses is in the Middle East and on Persia, which today is Iran. Since these kings rule one after another after another, leading up to the return of Christ in power and glory, which king is ruling today? In the past 200 years, Iran has not split up into a kingdom of the north and a kingdom of the south. So we can't be any further than the fourth king because the events of the fifth king haven't been fulfilled. And all the events of the fourth king haven't been fulfilled. Yet note, I said, all the events of the fourth king have not been fulfilled. Some of the prophetic events of the fourth king have been fulfilled. And when we look back in history to the time when Persia changed its name from Persia to Iran, guess what? We are on the fourth ruler. Coincidence? No way. The ruler at the time when Persia changed his name to Iran in 1935 was Raza Shah Pahlavi. He ruled in from 1925 to 1941 and when he was forced out. However, his son became the new ruler and his name was Muhammad Raza Shah Pahlavi and he ruled until 1979 when he was forced out. The third ruler was Supreme Leader Ruhollah Khomeini. He ruled in 1979 until his death in 1989. The fourth ruler is Sahad Ali Khomeini, who has been ruling since 1989. He was born on July 17, 1939. He turned 75 in 2014. Is Khomeini far richer than the first three rulers? That is the golden question right now. And the answer we find with the help of Reuters, a 2013 report that uh, we can find on the website titled The Assets of the Ayatollah and is written by Steve Stetlo, Babak, Degon Peche, and Yagane Tropate. Congratulations great article to support where we are in the prophetic events. In this article, they write about Satad's holdings of real estate, corporate stakes, and other assets. And they say that the organization's total wealth is difficult to pinpoint because of the secrecy of its accounts. But Satad's holdings of real estate, corporate stakes, and other assets total about $95 billion Reuters have calculated. That estimate is based on the analysis of statements by Satad officials, data from the Tehran Stock Exchange, the company websites, and information from the U.S. Treasury Department. 
Just one person controls that economic empire, Hamene. Now, how wealthy was Humaini? When Humaini, the first supreme leader, set in motion the creation of Satad, it was only supposed to manage and sell properties without owners and direct much of the proceeds to charity. Satad was to use the funds to assist war veterans, war widows, and the downtrodden. According to one of his co-founders, Satad was to operate for no more than two years. Under Hamenei's control, Satad began acquiring property for itself and kept much of the funds rather than simply redistributing them. With those revenues, the organization also helps to fund the ultimate seat of power in Iran, the Biete Rabar, or Leader's House, according to a former Satad employee and other people familiar with the matter. The first Supreme Leader, Khomeini, had a small staff. To run the country today, Hamane employs about 500 people in his administrative offices, many recruited from the military and security services. How rich was Muhammad Raza Shah Pahlavi, the last Shah of Iran, the second king of the succession of the eight kings leading up to the return of Christ? All totaled, Reuters was able to identify about $95 billion in property and corporate assets controlled by Satad. That amount is roughly about 40% bigger than the country's total oil exports last year. It also surpasses independent historians' estimates of the late Shah's wealth. After toppling the monarchy, the Islamic Republic filed suit in the United States against the Shah and his wife, Farah Pahlavi, claiming that they had stolen $35 billion in Iranian funds according to the, to the court records. In today's dollars, that sum would be worth about $79 billion. That lawsuit was dismissed. Abbas Melani, director of the Iranian Studies Program at Stanford University, who wrote a biography of the Shah, the second king of the succession of the eight, published in 2011, told Reuters he believes the estimate of the Shah's fortune was extremely exaggerated. He said that the monarch lived a truly opiate lifestyle, including owning an automobile collection that may have included 120 fancy vehicles. But, he wrote in the biography, those most likely to know estimate the Shah's fortune to be close to a billion dollars. With inflation, that would equal about $3 billion in today's money, a fraction of the worth of the Satad's holdings. Hamenei is worth about $95 billion. The ruler before him was Humaini, and he had a small staff, and he was into charity, and he didn't come close to Hamenei's wealth. Muhammad Raza Shah Pahlavi's wealth is estimated to be about $1 to $3 billion and he took over as Shah when his father was removed from power, and there is no reports of Raza Shah Pahlavi having any significant amount compared to the $95 billion. So that means Hamane wins the prophetic prize for being far richer than they all, and he will continue to fulfill the prophetic events of the fourth king. Hamane is going to go to war, do according to his will, his dominion is going to become great, and he will stir up all against the realm of Grisha. Welcome back. That clip had a lot of information in it, didn't it? A lot of information. But it is so powerfully informative to be able to give us insights that Kamini is absolutely 100% far more wealthy than his three predecessors. No question about it. And uh, he is stirring up all against the realm of Grisha. And who's Grisha? Absolutely, 100%, it has to be the United States. And, uh, and so since Kamini um, is struggling with prostate cancer, we should be able to start seeing 
uh, progress towards the fulfillment of these prophecies. This is a huge time. We are talking about a major, major Bible prophecy that the United States is supposed to attack Iran and Turkey and remove those two leaders from power. Even today, we are not seeing any sign of the United States getting ready to attack Turkey. But you know what? For years, we didn't see any signs of the United States getting ready to attack Iran. But now it's shaping up, isn't it? So this is huge. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the chart again. We've now covered the first two chapters of the prophetic playbook story. We've talked about Revelation chapter 17, and we've talked about Daniel chapter 11, and we've been able to show you that both John and Daniel reference the same succession of eight kings leading up to the return of Christ in power and glory. Now, now's your opportunity to go through the book again and go through uh, the first 14 uh, items on the 53 list and uh, mark if you feel yes, no, undecided, I don't know, or probably so. And uh, mark them down. Now this is important because I'm saying that if you don't say no, if you're not saying no, then anything else, I'm saying, I'm suggesting that we should prepare as if this is going to happen until we have proof, evidence, we know for sure that it's not going to happen. But if it does happen, it is so important that we start to take action now. Again, I'm not breaking any new news to you. You've been reading the book. You know that one of the five critical events leading uh, between now and about 2033 uh, is referenced in the book. Let me go ahead and pull that up. The first of the five critical events that we're looking to happen between now and 2033 is a war between the United States and Turkey and Iran. So. Uh, we're going to be watching for that. But if that happens, then the second critical event is the fate of the United States. Not the fate of the people, but the fate of the 50 United States. And uh, you've been reading the book. You know that what we're talking about is that the United States is uh, will split up into four nations. Again, right now, um, there's some people that are saying, well, I can see how that can happen. A lot more people today are saying that than five years ago, uh, 10 years ago. So at least we're getting uh, a little more movement to where we can see that's possible. The thing that I want to do is I want to prepare for a plan A and a plan B. The plan A is let's go ahead and have an open discussion with politicians and candidates and people in general about um, how we can have a better government. How can we have a better monetary system? In both cases, less corrupt. In both cases, ones that could endure the onslaught of what's coming prophetically. That's plan, that's plan A. Plan B, plan B is to have an open discussion about, okay, what if? What if the United States does split up into four nations? What do we want our new country's government to look like? What would we want our new country's monetary system to look like? How could they both be less corrupt and, and be more efficient and be set up to be able to weather through the events coming our way. Major, major discussion. And now, with what you saw today, you went through Daniel chapter 11, a good portion of it, and you saw evidence that indeed Daniel did talk about the succession of eight kings. The same succession of eight kings that John saw. 
Well, that's what I feel. Now, it love to know what you feel about it. You can see we can have a very good, lively discussion about this. And I want to get to that point. But you, right now, what we're going to do is, uh, is we're going to get to the end of this clip so you can get to the next clip. With the next clip, we're going to go through Revelation chapter 18. And we're going to be talking about the, the destruction of the, the city that sets on seven hills. We're going to be talking about that. And again, just want to bring out how it's so important that we have a view not only of what's happening today, but what's coming up. And one of the things that uh, is coming up many, many years from now is the destruction of this city here. And that city is the hub for the worldwide evil monetary system, the mark of the beast system. And as we, as we saw in the clip yesterday, we don't want, we don't want to have that mark. We don't want to participate in that monetary system because there's literally hell to pay. And uh, so, uh, on to the next clip. Yeah, it's so important. And then after that clip, we're going to get back to Daniel, and we're going to cover some more from Daniel chapter 8. These are two very, very important clips coming up. All right, see you at the next clip.